But we see this complete opposite between sort of the first man in whose image we're all made and the new man who's beginning a new creation that we're supposed to be made in his image now. So this, and then the whole story of what Jesus actually does, you know, rather he empties himself, he pours himself out. So in Adam, you have all this disobedience, you have the rejection of God, you have the selfishness. Um, immediately after sin, everybody turns on each other, right? Adam blames Eve, Eve blames the serpent, the husband and wife can't look at each other the same anymore. Everything has been shattered. And so in Jesus, you have a whole different thing. Adam is made to ascend to a higher level. So Adam's like here, but he's meant to become, to bring humanity up to God, to be the son of God and deliver that sort of destiny to all of us. But instead he falls because of sin. Then you have Jesus, who is God, who's at the highest you can be, you know, that we can conceive of. He's the Lord. He's equal to the Father. He's equal to God. And what does he do? He falls also, but he falls out of love and compassion in the sense that he falls from heaven to become one of us. So he does his out of obedience, out of love. He lowers himself. He empties himself to become the worst of the worst. He literally goes from the highest possible, God, to the lowest possible, a dead, condemned criminal of the state, someone hated by the world. And so in Jesus, he, he does exactly the opposite of what we see um, Adam doing. Also, that's why the second half of the cre of this statement, verses 9 through 11, because of this, because of being obedient, because of becoming human, because of pouring himself out, because of this humble, self-sacrificial, um, obedient love, because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, it's important to realize, um, you might be thinking to yourself, or maybe you're not, so I'll <laughs> tell you this. You might think to yourself, though, how can Jesus be exalted? Isn't he already there? In other words, as soon as the resurrection's done, doesn't he just go back where he was? How, in, in what way can he be exalted and enthroned and all the stuff that Paul's talking about? That's because we need to keep this in mind. What our teaching on the Ascension says is that Christ returns 40 days after his resurrection. He returns to the Father forever a glorified human being God. In other words, he is always Jesus the person now forever. So even in his humanity, it's that's what's glorified, not his divinity. But in his human nature, he has fulfilled what Adam was supposed to be. And so in his humanness even, he's now glorified as the king. Because here's the thing. Dominion of the earth was given to us. And therefore, it must be us who take it back from Satan. That's why Jesus, one of the reasons he has to become a human being. A human being must win back what was lost. Because God granted this world to you and I. Therefore, for all eternity now... Jesus has become human, part of him. He's forever connected to his humanity. And so even, in earth, even now in heaven, he rules as the glorified God, man, in his humanity. So he has a body and all those kind of things. So that's where Paul's coming from, is that everything that was meant to be in Adam has finally come full circle. Jesus has been enthroned, and now we need only wait for his return when all this will be will be fulfilled completely. So we're in the time period between the time of Jesus being coronated. That's what he understands his cross and ascension to be. Remember, Jesus himself says, when I am lifted from the earth, then you will all know that I am. In other words, when I'm crucified, then you'll get that I was always God. So Jesus, Paul, they see that the crucifixion, his death, and then his ascension into heaven that that's the beginning phase of the very end. 
He's ascended, so Christ is now leader of... Um, Christ is even now King of kings and Lord of lords. But he's just giving a return until he comes back at the second coming. And so we live in this in-between phase. Jesus has already won. The victory is already done. It's now simply up to us to continue to begin to live and act as if the kingdom is already coming in its power because we know that it is. And so that's what we're, our life is in between these two things. That's why, you know, at the very end of Matthew's gospel, that's why he says, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go now and make disciples of all nations so that when he returns, he'll know who are his and who are not. And so that's the Christian message. The Christian mission has returned, that we are restored to our vocation, that we actually have something to do. And what we have to do is we are mediators in the big mediator to unite heaven and earth. So we live out the gospel. We care for um, the planet. We care for each other. We show forth the kingdom even now as we await for Jesus to come and definitively um, restore it. So this is where Paul is coming from in, in everything he kind of says here. And he'll talk more about this Jesus and um, Adam connection um, very soon. Now, Paul also does something here that's very bold. When he talks about, at the name of Jesus, those, every knee will bend and every tongue confess that he's Lord. Paul is actually quoting from or, or alluding to a passage from Isaiah, where in the passage from Isaiah, God is telling Isaiah to let the people know both the Jews who have now fallen because of their sins, but also all the pagans watching what's happening, that he's the only God, and he doesn't share his glory with anyone. And so at the bottom of page 7 of your handout, you have this, the original phrase that it comes from. God says through Isaiah, Turn to me and be safe, all you ends of the earth, for I am God, there is no other. By myself I swear, uttering my just decree, a word that will not return. To me every knee shall bend, by me every tongue shall swear. So there he is with Paul's quoting. Only in, saying, only in the Lord are just deeds and power. Before him in shame shall come all who vent their anger against him. In the Lord all the descendants of Israel shall have vindication and glory. You can see this this. What you see in Paul is a complete change of his life. You had Paul Pryor, the Pharisee, who saw and would have read this um, and then looked at what was happening with the Christian movement and said, see, heretics, they don't know what they're talking about. Paul has so come so full circle. He himself quotes a story that God says, no one can be called by not my name except me. And Paul says, Amen except Jesus. <laughs> he could also be called by your name because you bestowed it on him. So you can see, by this time of his life, Paul has completely been transformed into his experience, his encounter with the Lord, into understanding that now everything that God the Father was doing, or who we call the God the Father now, is always has been, is now manifested and made real through Jesus. Jesus literally becomes that mediator through which everything pours through from God the Father. So um, Paul, as much as he can, is really pointing out to us the importance and who Jesus is in the middle of everything. The way Paul would say it is this. He, he would say Jesus, um, Jesus stands as the center of all reality. He's the center of the Trinity, because he comes from the Father, but with the Father he sends the Spirit. So he's right in the middle of that. But we also know from the book of, of Colossians and from the book of John that he was the Word, the Word was with God. Everything that was created was created in, for, through him. So in terms of creation, he's also the middle ground because he's the thing between the Father now and us. Everything's made in his 
image, likeness, vestige, everything from before he's ever incarnate. And so Jesus is literally the be-all and end-all of all existence. He's the one who is the sort of the main focus of the Trinity. He's the one who is in, in the world, is the um, incarnate son who everything is pointing towards and everything came from is the word. So Jesus is literally everything. And now he reigns in heaven as he said. So all this language about enthroning in heaven and um, being in heaven. Where is Paul kind of talking about this, this being exalted, being raised up to heaven? Well, again, what Paul has in mind is his own tradition. If you turn to the, if you have your Bibles, turn to the prophet Daniel, who's in, chap in chapter 7 of Daniel. And Daniel will give us um, sort of the background that Paul is drawing from right here of Jesus' exaltation. So in Daniel... Chapter 7, you have um, the story of four beasts. Daniel sees a vision of four consecutive beasts, and each of these beasts represent a human empire that basically tries to destroy the people of God or in some way end their, their status. So the four beasts in succession are um, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then Rome. And it's in the time of the last beast, in the time of Rome, that everything will finally occur that God has been planning for so long. And so in verse 9, Daniel's watching, and this is all a vision. He says, as I watched, thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his thrones. That's God, the Father. And it explains sort of what he looks like. His throne was flames of fire with wheels of burning fire. That's because he sits on the cherubim. The cherubim are actually described as being wheels with hundreds of eyes, Ezekiel tells us. And so God literally sits upon them. That's why even for the ark, they carved gold cherubim for his feet to symbolically be sitting on. It was like his footstool, the ark. So God's there in all his power. The river of fire surges out from him, the fire of his love and such. And the bajillions of angels that are ministering to him. So as he's doing this, um, verse 13, as the visions during the night continued, I saw coming with the clouds of heaven. And the cloud is always an image of God's presence. Um, God is on Mount Sinai in the dark cloud. A cloud takes Jesus away when he ascends into heaven. Hebrews tells us of the great cloud of witnesses that the saints are as they're in the divine cloud. So, he sees this divine presence, the cloud of heaven come. And then he says, one like a son of man. The word just means human being. Ben Adam, son of Adam, son of human being, son of a man. When he reached the ancient of days and was presented before him, he received dominion, splendor, and kingship. All nations, peoples, and tongues will serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away. His kingship, one that shall not be destroyed. Because of this, my spirit was anguished, and I, Daniel, was terrified by my visions. Now, why was Daniel upset, right? Isn't this what all Jews have been looking for? The end of the, the power of the pagans over them, the restoration of the kingdom of God. Well, he's upset because he doesn't know how to understand the vision, because he sees a human being, that's why he calls him a son of man, sitting on the throne of God and has God's power. Notice he rules over everything. Now, God, though, shares this power with all those who are with him. So verse 18, But the holy ones of the Most High shall receive the kingship to possess it forever and ever. That's you and I. Verse 22, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was pronounced in favor of the Holy Ones of the Most High, and the time arrived for the Holy Ones to possess the kingship. And then finally, verse 27, then kingship and dominion and majesty of all the kingdoms under the heavens shall be given to the people of the Holy Ones of the Most High, whose kingship shall be an everlasting kingship, whom all dominion shall serve and obey. So 
once the Son of Man ascends back to heaven to be with God, at that point, as Daniel sees in his vision, the Son of Man is then enthroned with the one with all power on heaven and earth, and then he shares that power with those are who are his followers, the holy ones. He shares the kingship, the dominion, his reign, so to speak, with them. Now, in between, however, what I didn't mention in some of the passages we skipped, it, you know, from verses like 23 through 26, is the final power of the last beast has to be destroyed. So the final beast. And that's why I talk about the beasts in Revelation. So there has to be the final sort of conflict before Jesus comes and takes what's his. But Jesus is the Son of Man. In fact, that's what got him killed. Go to the book of Matthew. Chapter 26, I believe it is. So Matthew 26. And remember what, he, what Daniel saw in his vision. On the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man coming to sit on the throne of God. So we come to Matthew. And Matthew uh, is telling us about when Jesus is facing the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high court. So it's chapter 26. Starting with verse 57. They keep trying to, Jewish law requires two witnesses. One witness cannot condemn a man, especially for a death penalty case. So they need two. But none of the false witnesses can compare. They, can, they can't get it straight. And so it's starting to look, you know, it's kind of one of those ironies of, of life. It's certainly not just ancient Israel. But, you know, we always want to give things a legality look when they're really, where we're trying to do something unjust. So they're trying to look good on the surface, look we have the witnesses but it's all for the purpose of what they've already planned to do, and that is get rid of Jesus. Anyway, they can't do it. So the high priest, verse 62, the high priest rose and addressed him. Have you no answer? What are these men testifying against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I order you to tell us under oath, literally, I adjure you. It's like the Pope who has authority over you to command you to do something. He says, you need to tell me the answer to this. That's what the priest, the high priest is doing. Basically saying, if you're really Jewish, Jesus, you will answer because of my authority. So he asks on his authority, I already you to tell us under oath before the living God, whether you are the Messiah, the son of God. Jesus said to him, reply, you have said so. But then he says, from now on, you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus says, I'm him. He quotes Daniel. Yes, I'm him. And that's what ends in his death. The high priest tore his robes and said he has blasphemed. We don't need any further witnesses. So Jesus admits who he is. He is the son of man. The son of man who is in that image of chapter 7 of Daniel, who will have all authority, who when he ascends to heaven will be king over everything. And of course the high priest and the Sanhedrin, they don't accept that. They don't believe it. And so, for, in their minds, he's lying. He's a blasphemer. He didn't actually, wasn't killed by saying he was God. They don't say that that's what he said. But he claims to be the Messiah. <laughs> and here they, they have before him this sort of pathetic-looking, beat-up, poor man. And they're like, really? You're the king? You're the king of Israel who will rule the world? That can't possibly be true. So... Jesus is condemned because, precisely because he finally admits at the end who he is. When he's been keeping secret the whole time and only living a little bit out at a time, at the end he finally admits under the oath of the high priest that he obeys as the high priest would expect and tells him who he is. So that's the exaltation in Philippians that Paul is referring to, that Jesus has the name above all names. Now by saying that, Paul goes a little further. He tells us, he kind of goes more in depth about what does it mean for a human being to sit on the throne of God? What does that mean? And so when he says he bestowed on him the name above every name, what he's really saying, the name he's talking about is, of course, the name of the God of Israel. Yahweh. But in the time of Jesus and Paul, and sometime prior, Jews of that time period read the second commandment that said, You not, shall not speak the name of the Lord your God in vain. They did not 
understand that to only mean you can't use God's name in oaths or to swear. They understood it that this name itself was so sacred you never pronounced it. It was pronounced one time in the year by the high priest on the day of Yom Kippur and no one else. Instead, um, whenever that name occurred, like it, when the priests were either doing the rituals at the temple or if you were in the synagogue and they were publicly reading. Um, and I don't know if any of you have ever been to a synagogue service, but um, the basic layout of the synagogue is very similar to the Catholic Church. <laughs> You have the Bema, which they don't use as sacrifice anymore, but you have the Bema up front where the altar would be. They have a tabernacle just like we do, but instead of having a Eucharist, they have the handwritten Torah scrolls. They have the one special pulpit from which the word of God is, is proclaimed and where the cantor sings from. And so they have a very similar setup. Well, as those and those Torah scrolls are still handwritten to this day. So when they, in Jesus' time and in, in our time now, when Jews unroll that and they read the reading for the day, just like Catholics have our readings for each day, so does the synagogue. That's where it came from. You have this little pen-like thing. Um, because Hebrew has no vowels and it has no punctuation, well, punctuation marks, and it has no breaks between words. Okay. And it just continues, right, through the whole story. So you have a little pen thing like this, and at the end of the pen, it looks like one of those modern-day teacher pointers. It looks like a tiny hand with a finger sticking out. That's what it looks like at the tip. It's called a yod. And so as you go along and you're reading very carefully so you know where to divide the words correctly, wherever this word occurs, immediately above it in red... Just like in our missile, the word rubric means red, because the things for what the priest has to do are written in red. Above it is the name Adonai, which means Lord. So that the person reading, when they see that name and this color above it, they know immediately I don't pronounce the name. I say Adonai, and everyone in the congregation knows what's been said. So... Adonai, as I mentioned, means Lord. All that kind of gives you an idea of when we say a simple sentence like Jesus is Lord, or what Paul says here, the name above all names, what we're saying is Jesus is Yahweh. And so it was, it's a real confession of faith. It doesn't just mean he's the master, the greatest king of the world, things like that. Paul is now, as the rest of the Christian uh, tradition did, Paul is now clear that, yes, he is the human Davidic Messiah. That's absolutely true. And he's, and he's in heaven enthroned as the king of the world as a human. But don't lose sight of the fact that he's so much more than even that. He is the Lord. Right? He's the one who parted the Red Sea. He's the one who brought the plagues upon Egypt. He's the one who's brought Israel to where it is. He's Yahweh. And so Paul here in, in this little hymn, and this hymn was probably sung in religious services, just like we sing hymns. He assumes that the it's probably well known to the Philippians because he quotes it without, he just plugs it in without any buildup. So they're, they're clearly used to it, probably reciting and hearing it. So he's using this hymn to just let them be reminded of who Jesus is. And then it makes more sense, the whole story, because it's one thing to be a human king who has, in a sense, you know, gone native and you're with the people. It's quite another thing to say he was also God, and he literally poured out his own power in order to just become a human being. And he didn't come in great glory as a human being or anything else. And in fact, he even is killed as a human being. Um, and out of that... He, he then returns in his glory, both his humanity and his divinity. That's more important, Paul says, because now if God's the very <coughs> example that we're supposed to follow, how can you and I not follow that, right? How can we be triumphalistic or prideful or arrogant or unwilling to serve when the Lord of Lords himself has done this for us? So that's really what Paul's sort of trying to get across in this whole section and that's why immediately after it, in verse 12, 
Immediately afterwards, he connects the hymn of what Jesus did with what you and I are supposed to do. So he says, so then, my beloved, obedient as you have always been. And remember, he just told us Christ was obedient, even to the point of death on a cross. And so Paul now is sort of doing two things at once. He's congratulating them. He, he says, you really have been obedient. You've been good Christians. But he's also making clear that he's saying under uh, between the lines, and so you better keep doing it because the real test is coming. So obedient as you have always been, not only when I am present, but all the more now when I am absent. Right? Paul's saying, I'm not there to help you anymore. You've got my letters, but I'm not there. You've got to man up and do it yourself. Can you be Christian without me? Or is it just for my sake, my benefit, when I'm around, you're Christian? So he says, now that I'm not there, you have to show your obedience more than ever. And he says, so now that I, when I'm absent, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Realize what's, what's happened to you. Realize what Christ has done for you in all this. And now approach that in this in this attitude of reverential awe. He doesn't mean be terrified of God. He's saying, realize who's at work in you. Right? Christ has given you his own spirit. Christ has united you to himself in his own body. The Father is in Christ and Christ is in the Father. Therefore, the whole Trinity is with you. There's nothing to be afraid of in terms of failure. And if you recognize that God's the one working in you all, then you should approach that with fear and trembling. Also, it's important because he says, work out your salvation. Your there is plural. He doesn't mean each of us in our own devotional life, as nice as that may be. That's not his focus. He's saying, as the group, as the church, assist each other in approaching God in this way. And as the group, be like Jesus to each other and to those outside. Be obedient. Be humble. Be sacrificial in your love. Give service to others. He's saying that's what the group is to do. Certainly as individuals, we take that on, but he's really concerned that we are part of a body. And so we work together as a body. So he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But then look at the very next verse. It's not like you're thrown on your own resources to try to do your best. He says, for God, God is the one who, for his good purpose, works in you both to desire and to work. He says, God's the one who even gives you the reason you want to be saved. And you've accepted that. He didn't force it, but he gives you that idea. And he's the one who, in fact, does the work for you. That when you do the work, you're simply responding to the grace he gives you to be able to do it and to even want to do it. So Paul is saying, so what are you so afraid of, right? It's not about you and it's not up to you. You're not on yourself trying to live this Christian life. You're living it in the Trinity surrounding you, in you, with you, and along with the whole Christian community. So he's telling the Philippians on a concrete level, so these problems you're having, the um, it's really not, um, it hasn't reached the point of actual persecution yet, but sort of the alienation, the cultural backlash you're starting to have from friends, family members, um, work partners, things like that, because of your Christianity, Paul tells them, don't let this worry you, right? Don't turn and run now. Don't give up your faith. Don't, don't stop, you know, becoming Christian because we're all at work with you to do everything you need. And I think I mentioned this last week, but I want to mention it again. And um, that is, always remember, <coughs> Jesus is the perfect image of the Father. When you see Jesus, you see the Father. That's what he himself tells us. When he's asked by Philip, show us the Father, he gets annoyed. He said, Philip, have I been with you for three years and you asked me to show you the Father? Don't you know that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? When you see me, you see the Father. So remember that. Remember that. Because sometimes we think of the Father in different ways. We think of the Father as the mean, scary judge up above who can't wait to sort of smite us if he has to. And Jesus is the nice, gentle, peaceful one. That's a lie. 
Jesus is exactly what the Father is. The Father is not what we say he is. So as you see Jesus, that's who the Father is. That's the Father. He's the one who started the whole process to begin with. He's not there just waiting to get his justice or pound of flesh. The Father is the one who pours all this out. It's the Father who gave the Son, knowing what the Son would have to endure. And he did it out of love for us. And he's the one who pours forth the Spirit with his Son. He's the one who, when Jesus says, when I enter into you, so does the Father, and we make our dwelling within you. So the Father's in you as well. So the Father, we have to recognize, God is entirely love on our side. There's not a part of God that's sort of the tough, mean, hardcore one, and then the gentle, sort of sappy one, right? You've got one God. And so it's important to keep that in mind, because sometimes we develop weird ideas, mostly about the Father, right? The Father's kind of unavailable, he's out there, he's kind of beyond everything, and Jesus is sort of right here and kind and nice, and no, it's both are all in everything, working through this, um, through, our, through loving us and such. So Paul is, is now putting it on us as Christians, he's saying, well now we have to live in the way that um, Christ himself lived, he's our model, we do it with fear and trembling. And so he also mentions obedience. So obedience is part of this whole understanding. And Paul by obedience means something deeper than we generally think of. Um, does Paul mean we have to sort of obey the teachings of the gospel? Yes, of course he does. But that's not what Paul's main concern is. His concern is on a, on a personal and communal level, as the church, community, the parish, and as an individual, Obedient, are you surrendered to the Father the way Jesus was? It's not just, hey, Lord, when I get to heaven, I can show you my checklist. I went to Mass every Sunday like I was supposed to, and, and I went to confession once a year. That's not going to be good enough. I'm sorry, right? God says, that's nice. Did you change your life? Did you become more generous? That's what he's concerned with, as long as they're in, and they should feed each other. Life at Mass should feed our life outside Mass and vice versa. So he's really talking about a deeper surrender of obedience, like, have you surrendered yourself? Not out of the sake of sort of, I have to, I obey these rules. That's nice, but do you go beyond that and actually live out the gospel personally? And so that's what Paul is talking about in this fear and trembling, that, um, you know, this is something you need to do. The other thing, verses 12 and 13 give us an insight into Paul's understanding of salvation. And that is on the bottom of page 10, the last paragraph. Salvation is not only something a person receives. It is a gift. It's a free gift. But after you receive the gift, it's something you also have to participate in. Right? You're not a spectator sport of your own salvation. God grants you the grace. God bestows the grace. God continues to work with you, inspire and guide you. But you have to respond. No one can respond in your place. No one can do it for you. You have to say yes yourself to the Lord and begin to work with what he's given you. So that's why Paul can say these two sides of the same issue. When on one hand, he says God's the one doing it, working it out in you. But on the other hand, you have to be responding in fear and trembling and obedience. So you have to be part of this process that's happening. And so Paul... Um, you know, has an understanding much more broader than we tend to give him because we've kind of brought him down to this level of arguments in the church 1,500 years after he was alive about faith and works and faith, you know, and all this kind of stuff, where Paul doesn't fit into those nice categories the way we'd like him to. Um, on page 11, I talk more about this fear and trembling. The first full paragraph that awe, this fear and trembling Paul's mentioning, is not terror or insecurity, but it's meant to be understood as confidence in the power and majesty of God in Christ, who empowers them, you and us, you and I, to be obedient and to work out their salvation as he himself guides their efforts. The word for this is synergism. You hear it all the time now in business. <laughs> it's a Greek word. It just means two energies or energy together. And it's the idea that God is the one who supplies it all, 
but you supply your yes, your surrender as, as cooperating with what the Lord gives you. And so our salvation, that's why Paul uses the term, we are God's co-workers. that we have a stake, we have a part to play in our own salvation. And if we fail, we can't blame God at the end, because God will say, I gave you everything needed. If anyone failed, it was you. By choosing not to work, or by when failing, not asking to be forgiven and move forward. But we're God's co-workers. We're the ones who help him in this process. And that goes very much back to this whole idea of, of Adam, right? We have a vocation. You and I are meant to divinize, to make God present to this world in our generosity, in our love, in our concern, etc. And so from the beginning, the plan is that we're co-workers. In the Catholic view, and I would say the Jewish view as well, from which it comes from, that's part of the great dignity of human beings. You know, part of the dignity is God loves and endows us with enough power ourselves that you and I can do good, right? We can do things. Yes, with his grace, but we do it. You know, we become actual co-workers in what's happening. You know, it sounds good on paper, the evangelical idea of once saved, always saved, until you begin to see that that really starts to fall apart when you, when you ask yourself some questions. So, once I accept Jesus into my heart, I'm saved forever. Yes. So I don't ever have to do anything else. Yes. And I can't lose it. Yes. All right. So if I go to Singapore and impregnate 30 women and stuff, I'm still good, right? Right. Well, then the average evangelical will start to sort of backtrack a little, right? Because they know it's ridiculous, but that's really what they're saying. And what you're also saying is that, so really, before salvation, I was more free than I am after. Because before I could sin or do evil, but now I can only do good. And even if I sin, it doesn't matter. So now I've become a puppet. See, if you really start to think through what is being said there, like I said, it sounds good on paper. We'd all like to say one moment in time, I love you, Jesus, and it's done, right? And I don't have to, now I just skate through life. But in reality, it doesn't work out quite that well. And they know that too. The funny thing is, is then they have to give weird answers as to why, when bad things happen, why it happened. So Jim Baker, do you remember that whole thing way back? When that all happened, um, Who's Jerry Lee Lewis's cousin? Who's the famous? He was a famous evangelist too. Um, the other one who was uh, not Pat Robertson. It was um, <coughs> Jimmy Swagger. Yeah. Is Jerry Lee Lewis's cousin? His aunt. His his response to um, Jim. Ba- I'll, I'll never forget this. Even as a young teenager, when that happened, his response to that was, "Well, he was never really saved." Okay. <laughs> So in other words, although you claim everyone's certain they're saved once they say that, that's not actually true. So how do you figure that out then, right? Sorry, I'm going off on this a little bit. It's just, you know, there's something about it that's, that just smacks against what God wants of us. He does this for us because he values us. He wants us to be like him. He wants us to kind of take initiative and say, yes, I'm going to be a part of this, Lord. I'm part of this plan. It's all your work supplying it. It's all your grace that enables me to. But I am saying, yes, I'm giving it my yes. So my own sweat and blood and tears and prayers and everything else, I'm pouring into this the way Jesus poured into it. And it's not because we think you have to work yourself to death to get saved. Because clearly none of us fulfill that very well, right? We sin every day, sometimes seriously. And yet God just says, okay, so pick yourself up. And now we'll start again, start again, start again. The famous quote of St. Francis every morning, today I begin anew. (laughs) Yesterday's gone, now let's start with this day and see how I fare, you know. (laughs) So um, the idea is that, you know, we're not, and, and we also should do it in a spirit of joy. You know, he talks about verse 14, do everything without grumbling or questioning. That you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. He's saying, you know, don't approach this obedience begrudgingly. I'll do it because I have to or else I'm going to go to hell, right? Or some weird thing like that, we think. He's saying, no, 
realize that what's happening to you is the spirit is restoring, renewing, healing you. He's bringing you into the very life of Christ. And though we don't experience it all so gloriously here on earth, Christ didn't. Nevertheless, we're certain of what's coming when there will be the time with no death or suffering or pain or sorrow. There will only be the perfect love of the Lord and all of his creation restored. And so, you know, in every aspect of life, he's telling us, get that new desire. Get that love that God is giving to you. He's the one who gives you the desire, so pray for it if you don't think you have it. And then manifest that desire of being like God in what you do, right? Manifest. So in other words, our belief must lead to our behavior. We all know this, but sometimes we sort of don't live by it, right? And I'm not talking about the fact that we'll all fail in our behavior. That's fine. But I'm talking about not even trying. You know, we say we believe you know, in mercy, but we're never merciful. And we say, and you know, it's different. Sometimes there's their sins, and so we repent of them. But sometimes they're a whole attitude. All I need to do is obey the rules. And so I kind of close myself off in my little box, and I do my thing. I go to mass, I do my thing, I do my prayers, I do my devotions. And the rest of the world, it's kind of, eh, whatever, right? I don't engage. I don't become an actual co-worker. And so what, what um, St. Augustine called that, he has a great term. He said, like a turtle in its shell, we turn inwards. We become curvatus in se. We become curved in, that we can't see God above or humans in front. All we see is our own feet, right? Or our navel, where you get the term navel gazing, right? It's all about me. It's all about me. And so Paul is warning the Philippians, who have been doing well, but he's saying, don't let the this stress that's now become that's now happening, don't let this begin to sort of knock you off what you've been doing so well. Because he's saying, you know, stop grumbling about it. Stop whining about how hard it is because you're Christian and everyone's being, you know, tough on you. He says, but be blameless and innocent, children of God. And he said, and notice he mentions the world outside is crooked and perverse. I mean, it's not a good, God's view of the outside world is not a great one, right? He's disappointed to say the least with humanity. So Paul says, you're the ones he draws great love from because he sees in you his son working. And so be proud of that. Own who you are. Be who that person is in Christ. And then he says, among whom you shine like lights in the world. Now this has two kind of meanings. Again, Paul always pulling back on his Jewish tradition, but also what Christ said. He mixes the two perfectly. Well, the one from Christ should be probably pretty easy. Where does Christ talk about light and such? Anyone remember? Everybody. He's the light of the world, right? But what does he tell us, too? You are the light of the world. We're the little lights and the salt of the earth in the same teaching, right? So part of it's that. It's the re reference to we're the, little, we're the little glow or the afterglow of the big light. So when the world sees us in this world of darkness, we appear as these... As, as Paul says, as lights in the world. Now, the other one that's um, a little more, you'd have to sort of know the Old Testament a lot better, um, is that he talks about lights in the Old Testament in the books of Sirach and Wisdom. I don't know if I'll have you guys actually turn there. Let me see really quick. But basically, he's also pointing forward to our, our eternal life when we're going to be um, saved. Actually, I, I guess we will. Um, let's look at it real quickly. Um, in the book of Wisdom, Wisdom chapter 3. <laughs> you often hear this read at funerals a lot of times, but um, it's really expanding this idea of light into what Paul's also drawing from. Because Paul doesn't only have now in mind, he's also telling us how you live now as a light of the world will determine your light, so to speak, at the end. And so in verse um, 
Actually, let's start with chapter 2. Um, in chapter 2, the whole chapter 2 is probably one of the most accurate prophecies of Jesus' death that is found in the, in the Bible. Written about 200 to 300 years before Jesus, um, you have this, this story of how people are acting. And like in verse 6 of chapter 2, it says, let us enjoy the good things that are here, make use of creation. All right, let's party it up because we don't know what's coming and it, we're probably all just going to be dead. So this is our portion, this is our lot. And then with verse 10, it suddenly sort of switches. He says, these are still the people of the world. They say, let us oppress the righteous poor. Let us neither spare the widow nor revere the age, aged. Let our strength be our norm of righteousness, right? Might makes right. Who has the power? That's what's important in this life. For weakness proves itself useless. Let us lie in wait for the righteous one because he is annoying to us. He opposes our actions, reproaches us for transgressions of the law, and charges us with violations of our training. He professes to have knowledge of God and styles himself a child of the Lord. <clears throat> to us he is the center of our thoughts, merely to seem as a hardship, because his life is not like that of others and different are his ways. He judges us debased, he holds aloof from our paths as from things impure, he calls blessed the destiny of the righteous, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the righteous, and boasts that God is his father. Now, right? I mean, you can't get closer than that to Jesus. <laughs> the one who has son of God, professed to have none, calls God his father, calls the destiny of the poor blessed, all these things. So what do they do? Verse 17, let's see if his words are true. Let's find out what will happen to him in the end. For if the righteous one is the son of God, God will help him, deliver him from the hand of his foes. With violence and torture, let us put him to the test that we may have proof of his gentleness and try his patience. Let us condemn him to a shameful death, for according to his own words, God will take care of him. And isn't that the crucifixion scene? Mocking him, right? Come off the cross. Even the other thief says, if you're really the son of God, <coughs> save us, right? Why are you putting up with this? Verse 21. These were their thoughts, but they erred, for their wickedness blinded them, and they did not know the hidden counsels of God, neither did they count on a recompense of holiness, nor discern the innocent soul's reward. For God formed us to be imperishable, the image of his own nature he made us, but by the envy of the devil, death entered the world, and they who are allied with him experienced it. So you have the lead up. Now chapter three, where we connect with the lights. So you have how the world acts in its norm, and that's power, right? That's what it's all about. It's about power. Um, and then the man comes forward in gentleness and meekness, but telling them to change their ways, giving them this example. He claims to be a son of God, all these things. So they said, okay, well, let's do what we say. If the norm is power, let's kill him, right? And see what happens. So in their minds, it's victory. But God tells us, but they don't understand what was really happening. And then in verse 3, he says, and this is the one that's usually used, to, that you hear a lot of funerals. The souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment shall touch them. They seemed, in the view of the foolish, to be dead. And their passing away was thought an affliction, and their going forth from us utter destruction. For if to others indeed they seem punished, Yet their hope is full of immortality. Chastise a little, they shall be greatly blessed, because God tried them and found them worthy of himself. As gold in the furnace, he proved them, and as sacrificial offerings, he took them to himself. In the time of their judgment, they shall shine, there you go, and dart about like sparks through stubble. They shall judge nations and rule over peoples, and the Lord shall be their king forever. Those who trust in him shall understand truth, and the faithful shall abide with him in love. So Paul, by talking about this, you shine among them, he's saying both now, in the present, we shine as the lights of the world. But in the future, that light will only carry forward as we shine in the glory that God bestows upon us. So Paul is, is telling the Philippians, what you do now matters. 
because what you do now has ramifications for the end, for when the end comes. By the way, just, just a little tiny tidbit of trivia. This book, you know, there's most of the Old Testament was written in a certain period. And then Catholics and Orthodox, um, we have books that are written sort of an in-between period between most of the Old Testament's writings and the New Testament. There's about five of those out of the seven that we have that are extra. The Book of Wisdom was written by a Pharisee. And I only point that out so that we kind of begin to understand that the Pharisees weren't all Jesus' enemies. In fact, Paul was a Pharisee. Many of the early Pharisees became Christian. And you can see by the writing of the one Pharisee writer we have in the entire Bible, until Paul in the New Testament, you can see how, how aligned they already were with Christianity. The Pharisees weren't like the Sadducees who ultimately have Jesus killed. The Pharisees were arguing points of doctrine and disputing, but a lot of the things they held in common. And so when you read this book, I think you especially start to see, um, you know, the, the closeness that many of the Pharisees had as they were awaiting the Messiah when the Messiah finally came. So, okay. Um, <clears throat> so back to Philippians. So what Paul is telling us, which I don't think is any surprise to most of us as Catholics, that salvation is a free gift, and it's a gift of God's grace. You can't earn it. But at the same time, it still requires to accept that divine mercy and now trying to live according to the Spirit. And to live according to the Spirit is to try to live according to Jesus, because it's his Spirit, is how Paul refers to it. So it does have a behavioral aspect. Um, it might be funny for us in the modern time to realize, but in the ancient world, except for Judaism, at least in the pagan religions of, of Europe and the Middle East, there was no connection whatsoever between morality and spirituality. Your moral things were set usually by your country, your ethnicity, and maybe your philosophy. The philosophers talked about morality. The gods and the worship of the gods had nothing to do with morality. In the pagan conception, at least of that region of the world, um, human beings' relationship with the god was not one of morality. Now, each god might have a particular thing it approved of. And so in that sense, you know, you would, you would do something. But it wasn't necessarily this whole idea of there was standards of morality that religion upheld. That wasn't true. It's odd for us because we can't think of a religion like that. All modern religions are connected to a morality. But in the ancient world, that wasn't true at all. And so um, Judaism, that's why so many people were attracted to Judaism, because for the Greco-Roman world, it was so different. And it kind of combined the two things, you know, the spiritual dimension and the intimacy with God that they longed for. But at the same time, it was very philosophical in the sense that it had moral prescriptions the idea that there's only one power that rules everything, not millions of gods who are sort of constantly always fighting, you know. And so it gave them a structure that they understood to the whole world that philosophy could live by. So that's why Christianity became so popular. Um, but it's kind of funny today because I think we're starting to see a little bit of a regression. That is, there are a lot of people, whenever you hear this, and if you've said this yourself, I'm sorry to offend you. I'm not sorry you are offended, but I'm sorry to offend you. <laughs> That is, I'm spiritual but not religious. Yeah. Now, there are legitimate, sometimes people legitimately have things. Religion has hurt them in some way. I mean, we know that. But for most people, what they're basically saying, whether they want to admit this or not, is I believe what I want and make it up as I go along. Right? That's what spiritual without religion means. Because if you take religion away, that means you take away all the commandments, any of the rules, any of the guidelines, anything... And all you're left with is sort of kumbaya and balloons, right? Whatever I want to feel good, that becomes religion. And so it cuts right at the core of the idea that we have responsibility as people of religion. You know, that we have responsibility towards others, a responsibility towards God. People who are spiritual are not and not religious are not self-sacrificial, obedient people, no matter what they want to come across as. At best, they serve causes, which is just an extension of my own selfishness. And usually the cause is one that the culture approves of. So in other words, it's all about me, what I look like, things like this. Francis of Assisi has a great statement. 
Those who are spiritual without religion are never found in soup kitchens. <laughs> that's an 800-year saying. I think that's a great one, right? But he's right. He saw it even in his own time. But, you know, we see this, and, and it can be dangerous. People want to learn all these types of prayer. That's a good thing. I want to learn centering prayer. I want to learn meditation. But if you want that, just so you can have an experience of God, but you really don't want to live the gospel part, then you're really just spinning your wheels. Because all you're doing is making yourself more self-concerned, self-centered, self-interested. If it's not, because this, what you've done is you, if you imagine you as like this sponge, you know, and here the spirit comes so that the spirit enters you, but also flows out through you to others. Well, if we're not careful, we basically bounce him back because we don't want it to get out to others. We have no desire to sort of, you know, extend ourselves. We just want the, quote, blessings we want for ourselves. So let's go ahead and take our break. We'll come back and while we do a period of some questions and stuff, and then after that, if we finish in time, we'll start to look a little more of Paul. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Y